So how is it that we can best hope to build a house as naturally as possible before we begin to live in it? We live fast lives, unknowingly get dragged toward ideas and solutions without considering the consequences upon coming generations and upon our planet. All in order to fulfill our desires as instantly as possible. The manner in which we attempt to shape ourselves reflects in the manner in which we choose to shape our house. It's easy to deceive ourselves in terms of what we are and who we come from. Our ground and our roots are hereditary and possess the answers to how we shall create a firm roof over us and call it a home. So what are our roots? Who is it that we come from? Stretching back far in time, approximately 10 to 12,000 years ago, a global rise in sea levels began across Earth. Modern-day geologists have termed it as Meltwater Pulse 1B, an event that brought a catastrophic flood across continents, destroying and sinking huge islands and land masses across the world. According to the scriptural accounts such as the Matsya Puran and the Shiv Puran, the ancient Sumerian tablets, Biblical, Egyptian and Greek mythology and also the local legends of southern India, along with researchers from across the world. This flood was said to have wiped out an entire advanced civilization, known to have been culturally prevalent across much of the ancient world. Few of these include the poorly understood locales of Kumari Kandam and Sakal Dweep. The era that succeeded the event of this flood has been deemed by conventional historians and archaeologists to be the beginning of prehistoric civilizations. From Pan-Asiatic to Indo-European settlements, the occurrence or recurrence of first cities seemingly was observed from the lands of ancient Sumer till the region of Indus Valley and also Egypt. The sources indicate that the knowledge of natural building, agriculture, sacred sciences, arts and philosophy were not merely invented or conceived through primitive experimentation, but passed on through ancient scriptures and teachings by a mysterious group of sages and kings that had survived the flood. Civil engineer and editor Dr. Ashok Nene in his book Construction Techniques of Ancient India is highly reminiscent of this, mentioning that the remnants of the Indus Valley settlement can still be studied today, dating back to at least 2600 BC. Researcher and editor Lara Atwood in her book The Ancient Religion of the Sun points out to a recently discovered temple bearing arcane imagery and a set of hauntingly mysterious pillars, all made using limestone and mortar that belong to another Indo-Sumerian or Indo-European settlement in Turkey and which is by far one of the oldest prehistoric structures discovered till today, dating back to 9500 BC, which to any historian's surprise places it close to the aforementioned flood event and at the very dawn of prehistory. So, how did these mysterious civilizations sustain their buildings through vast stretches of centuries and millennia? The question comes quite unanswered, or answered less straightforwardly in our institutions. Both history and its eternally long-lasting buildings and artifacts are under attack, with terror groups destroying more than thousand-year-old colossal statues made of pure limestone, mud and straws, and world-famous museums seemingly misplacing important artifacts that don't fit the conventional model of history. There seems to be something more mysterious that perhaps might come out as shocking to some people out there. But before we dive deeper into it, we think it's necessary to first understand the extent to which the thought and craftsmanship that went behind in making of these structures. Among every such naturally built structure of ancient India with extraordinary lifespan, some of them belonging to the Indo-Greek or the Indo-Sumerian element 
or perhaps both, stretching back to thousands of years before, can still be studied, analyzed and replicated today, or in many cases have its components ignorantly removed, stolen and reused in recent projects. For example, a research article on website thesouthasian.com states that in 1921, quote, the first mention of the Indus Valley civilization is when a British Army deserter, James Lewis, posing as an American engineer named Charles Mason, recorded the presence of a vast ruined city with the remains of a ruinous brick castle and fragments of walls and buildings in the town of Harappa in Punjab. In 1856, two English engineers, John and William Brenton, were building a railway line from Karachi to Lahore. Whilst looking for ballast for the railway, they came across several mounds, which were supposed to be the ruins of an ancient city, built entirely of bricks. This city was Harappa. According to Mr. Asim Dogar, the curator at the Harappa Museum, not only did the railway engineers of the time use the bricks as railway track ballast, but also almost all the railway stations including Harappa railway station between Lahore and Multan were built using ancient Harappan side bricks. Similarly, the town people of Karande Harappa have also taken the liberty to freely remove and take these bricks back to their village for building their houses. Virtually half of the Harappa side bricks vanished due to this very reason." End quote. Upon studying, it seems that the urban settlements in the Indus Valley were architecturally simple, yet outstanding. Almost every household had continuous access to clean water from nearby wells and drainage facilities, including plumbing. The settlements also had a masterful urban sanitation and drainage system, systems of dam, of irrigation, and urban water channels, all made using burnt or sun-dried bricks with mortars and mixes made of soil and lime. Most houses in a town were identical and built together in courtyards, connecting upper to lower levels were set of brick stairs or sometimes ladders. The settlement of Mohenjo-daro reveals the ancient custom of the bathhouse, also prevalent in ancient India, ancient Sumer and in ancient Rome. And apparently, speaking of ancient towns or cities, the word Ur comes to attention. We've come across the oldest of known sources and scriptural records and come to an understanding that the most absolute and honest historical account would turn out to be the single most controversial book ever written, to the extent that it be rejected and shunned since it would challenge the worldview being imposed upon us in the current atmosphere. Coming to the question of who these people were, let us start by answering how were they connected with other cultures that today are seemingly distinct in language and ethnic background. We find profound inferences that speak of not just building methods, but of the culture, the ways of living, profound genetic ties that stretched far and wide all the way from India to the Western Hemisphere. Research conducted upon the Indus Valley site in Dholavira in Gujarat by Ravi Kant Prasad and V. N. Prabhakar from Archaeological Sciences at IIT Gandhinagar presents a vast range of natural materials and mixes that are nothing short of extraordinary, combinations of which are common throughout ancient sites. The presence of limestones, burnt bricks, an extensive variety of rock species, and evidences of detailed ornamentation with common symbols, jewelry, with revealing proof of advanced metallurgy. Moreover, the signboard at Dhulavira reads Menagara Nahapana. Conventional historians have identified it with the Indus script, aggressively avoiding any other possible connection outside of the regions other than South Indian languages. Mainstream websites such as Wikipedia have also been silent regarding any inferences that open bigger doors to knowing about an extensive ancient civilization with almost everything in common. The name Minagara is Old Frisian and culturally connected to Indo-Scythian and Indo-Greek. Same with the ancient region of Girnagara in Gujarat, currently known as Mount Girnar. The language of ancient Frisian is mentioned in the much debated Oralinda book, an ancient record that gives a detailed account of the ancient people of northern Germany and the Netherlands. 
Apparently, the language of Old Frisian, as mentioned in the Oralinda book, is derived from the Yol Chakra, an ancient symbol found throughout regions of India and regions of Europe. The standard script or the summed script of letters being derived from this chakra is known as Sanskrit, which to us seemingly is nothing short of a transliteration of Sanskrit. And by no means that is an implication of one language or culture being derived from the other, but perhaps both being derived from one common root. The ancient sites discovered in Tamil Nadu near the villages of Kihidi and Kodumanal have the exact same concentric planning typology as found in other ancient excavation sites across the world. There are claims that the symbols revealed from the Kihiri site have Indus or Scythian or Indo-European origin. Others claim it to have South Indian origin from the Brahmi script. We believe that it is all of the above, including Frisian influence a one single tradition of customs and beliefs across continents. Both the Buddha and the kings of the Maurya dynasty were said to be Scythian nobles, called the Shakyas. King Ashoka Maurya, a warrior king turned Buddhist peacemaker. In Girnagar, we find his rock edict number two, a revering acknowledgement of Antiako, or King Antiochus I Sauter, the Seleucid inheritor of Alexander's empire in Asia. In an almost enchanting ancient site in Turkey, amidst other 2,000-year-old statues of kings and deities, another and much later in period, Antiochus I of the kingdom of Kamajin is depicted as a Scythian royal, to have been wearing the royal Frisian cap or Phrygian cap. And apparently, both the Mauryan Shakya dynasty and the royal Scythian dynasty claim their origin from almost the same source. With the Scythians and the Greeks having strong cultural and genetic ties within populations in India, King Ashoka goes on to write in his rock edict number 13, stating an absolute victory of righteousness and prosperity, stretching one close ideological and cultural tie from India all the way to Egypt and Greece. This connection between the Indians, the Greeks, the Frisians, the Sumerians and the Scythians can get quite confusing. The term Scythians here is used as an umbrella term for all of the above and we have understood that these were all cousin peoples with common genetic and cultural ties at relatively different points in time and history and possibly separated on the basis of languages and the royal lineages of the rulers. There are raging debates today regarding whether the first of the Indo-Europeans began to build homes, ceremonial sites and cities in India and document their traditions via scriptures. Some claim it to be ancient Sumer, others claim it to be ancient Britain or ancient Egypt. And upon analyzing the linguistic and architectural inferences, the origins of the tribes, the highest possibility could be that it was all of the above in minor varying proportions. As said previously, Dr. Ashok Nene in his work centered his attention upon construction techniques as per the scripture records of the Rigvedic period of India that lasted approximately between 1500 BC to 500 BC and that succeeded the Indus Valley civilization, all considering that the current map of India does not remotely resemble the territory of India back in 1500 BC and that the boundaries of peoples and nations were not reinforced through political or ideological means but due to the ruling dynasties and the royal lineages. Dr. Nene begins his book introduction by addressing the scriptures written originally in Vedic Sanskrit by a mysterious group of sages and divine engineers. Alongside the figure of Manu that escaped the great flood as discussed before and took sanctuary in the Himalayas. 
The Frisians of Orelinda book also mentions their prophet Frizo and his arrival from the Himalayas sometime after the flood. Again, what draws our attention are the striking similarities we find in the pre-Christian sites of England and that of ancient excavations of Sumer and India. Researcher and author late Edward Davies in his book Celtic Researches on the Origins goes on to mention the ancient tribes of the Celts, known as the Kimbri, who are the genetic cousins of the Sumerians and who likely built the stone circles and address the figure of Manu. He goes on to say, quote, An ingenious friend of mine suggested that Menu Ab Tergwad, or Manu of the Three Veds, one of the masters of the mysterious and secret science among the Kimbri, is the same character and personage with Manu, the author of the Vedas. End quote. We find something very similar among the ancient Greeks, the ancient Germans, the ancient Egyptians, and the Frisians of the Oralinda book, all mentioning the figure of Minos, Manos, Menes, and Minno, respectively, describing him as a sage and a sea king who arrived at some point after the flood to give laws, to educate, and to teach people the techniques to build and to farm. Dr. Nene goes on to mention the construction sciences that were taught within these scriptures, such as the Shilpa Shastra that explains the science of sculptures. Across Asia and Europe, we come across the most transcendent works of art ever known to man, recognized as an imitation of universal laws, transmuted into masterful works of stone and marble. Moreover, the scripture of Sakaladikar explains the preparations and ingredients for soil mixes for building, while the Shat Padbrahman explains the methods for soil stabilization. The Vishnu Dharmodar Puran explains soil classification in the Indian context, and the Mayamat and Vastu Vidya center upon the physical and metaphysical sciences of orienting building spaces. He states that the engineers of the old days who had mastered the art of materials, civil engineering, architecture, and fundamental wisdom of human life were given the title of Sthapati, held by planners and architects in charge of a construction project the ones who had mastered the techniques as per the scriptures mentioned above. These old guidelines are fairly easy to recognize at first glance, but they speak a language that nature propagates throughout time and space in order for humanity to prosper by aligning with it through ways of building, living and orienting. These ancient engineers were a guild of builders who placed the highest value in recognition of materiality and function that align with the harmony of natural laws in all beauty and simplicity. The standards they set for building and construction throughout ancient sites were in direct consideration of their elite caliber of aesthetics, art, philosophy and culture. When we begin to piece all the information together, it can become quite confusing when attempting to paint an accurate picture of history of not just building construction but giving credit to the peoples and cultures from whom the traditions and techniques stem from. The credit which most genuine scholars attribute to are the ancestors of dynastic lineages and a root culture of all Indo-European and Asiatic civilizations. Speaking of our present situation, there is a significant misstep by our modern institutions and their subsidiaries of equating the term ancient to the term primitive and therefore to the term inferior. Natural materials such as mud, stone or wood cannot be approached with a conventional mindset. One must recognize the cyclical nature of earth, evolution, our environment and therefore of the naturally available materials in order to create vastly more breathable, healthy and chemical free environments. On the opposite end, this new and modern material of cement does not possess a natural cycle, unable to be disintegrated into any form of soil, and hence it bears no place anywhere on or within our planet. From causing carbon intoxication of environment in its manufacturing process, to its lack of sustainability with a lifespan of less than 50 years, it pollutes breathable air, wastes natural resources, 
and a significant amount of human time, attention and energy. The ancient techniques have prevailed for thousands of years, and quite understandably so, to every extent. These methods of construction sustain the structure for 300 years at the very least, as documented by Tunnel in Vayanad village in Kerala, and a massive family home in the village of Ganjam. At Tunnel, the practice of extensive research, archiving and the practical application of natural building techniques has been consistent for more than 12 years. In May of 2017, Biju Bhaskar had met Dr. Ashok Nene in person, which granted significant clarity on history of building techniques and its application in today's time. We channel our time and attention into reforming the so-called force of farmers, masons, laborers and workers who in many cases have become unionized today under corrupt systems that predominantly seek to impose and superficially shape our environments and therefore a new culture. This cultural subversion has negatively affected the role of these people. They are now seen as merely a tools for a job, as cogs in a machine of profit margins and sales records, instead of valuable professionals with necessary skills that serve a significantly higher and more sacred purpose. Our roofs and our walls have profoundly degenerated simply into a product of this system. We have taken the responsibility to not just explore but to create. Roofs without cement, purely made of natural components and presenting more than centuries old and time-tested life examples that stand as an open rebuke against the misconceptions. Flat mud roof, limecrete roof and madras terrace roof are some of the examples that are exponentially growing in popularity by regaining their lost identity. Collectively, we live in an age of cultural diffusion. We are all digitally connected, in one way or another. No man is isolated in this age of misdirected technological advancement. Our aim is to prudently guide everyone through this chaos. Seek only the relevant means to channel our attention and energy using online platforms. And again, History is a significant guiding principle, a central pillar around which our present can be ideally shaped. And the model of history being offered to us is significantly reduced and deeply fraudulent. One of the most profoundly necessary objectives is to gather the core knowledge of natural construction and the detailed information of its cultural and historical context from every possible direction and from the most reliable of sources. Ancient libraries and healing centers played a central role in maintaining an absolute natural and sustainable way of living. The library of Takshashila during the Mauryan period and the library of Alexandria in Hellenistic Egypt are prime examples. Two of the most profound centers of learning known to have cultivated the best and brightest minds of the day are now mysteriously lost to conspiratorial wars and destruction. It is said that these were not merely centers for scholars and philosophers, but for individuals involved in the most arcane and mysterious sciences of the universe. Both of these centers were considered as sanctuaries for knowledge that was salvaged from the ancient advanced civilizations as discussed before. Historians claim the downfall of empires and the devolving of civilizations, setting humanity back to thousands of years in the past since the destruction of these libraries. Therefore today, the research and documentation process of natural buildings, their techniques and their fundamental origin are an immense necessity in order to piece together the scattered remains of our past, in connection to our vastly more artful, natural and spontaneous means of construction, coupled with means of living, interacting and prospering in the same regard.